and verses 1 and 2. And then also 1 Kings chapter 17 and verses 10 through 13. Amen. Hallelujah. You all look really good today. Well, thank you. It's a mutual admiration society, right? Amen. Hallelujah. Second uh, Kings chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. And then we'll go over to 1 Kings chapter 17, verses uh, 10 through 13. Amen. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in the house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Uh, just go to the last part of verse 5. Um, or we'll read the whole verse. She, so she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons who brought the vessels to her, to her and she poured it out. And uh, 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 10 through 13. And a uh, different prophet, the prophet that was just before Elisha was Elijah. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I get confused between the two. But, uh, but we're uh, talking about Elijah in 1 Kings and Elisha in 2 Kings. So verse 10, so he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to fetch it, he called her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. And she said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, and a little oil in a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it for me and my son that we may eat and die. Amen. Let's pray, shall we? Thank you, Lord, so very much. Lord, for your presence in our lives, your presence in this service, I thank you, Jesus, for what you've done in each one of our lives. You've been so precious and so good to us. Singing that chorus, you are good, you are good, just touched my heart all over again when I remember where I was and the changes that you made in my life. I'm so thankful today, Lord, for that presence, for what you've done. And Lord, we just ask that your presence will remain here, let your anointing be upon each one that's here. Open up our hearts and minds to receive your word that it may impact our lives. Let the word fall upon good soil today. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. And you may be seated. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Brother Ted. I was, just, I was wondering. <laughs> amen. It's good to see everybody here. It's good to, uh, good to be here. As I mentioned, I've been working over on the mainland. Most of you know that between Wednesday and Friday. And uh, it's so good to have my wife back. Hey, man, most of you know I just get all kind of pathetic when she's gone for, especially when she's gone for that long. And, and uh, so I'm just thank. stop smiling, Andy. And uh, <laughs> I'm just thankful when she comes home. I just feel more like myself. Oh, she loved the entranceway. So she said she wants to do the whole kitchen in that now. So I've got my work laid out ahead of me. I uh, didn't know it was just starting, a, just the beginning of a good thing, right? Amen. I uh, try and surprise her. I've done it a few times where I've done a project around the house when she's gone and then try to surprise her when she comes home. And, and uh, most of the time she's been pleasantly surprised, of which I'm grateful. <laughs> Sometimes the changes maybe have not been what she wanted, but, uh, but I'm glad she's back. And uh, I, like I said, I feel more like myself. I want to uh, talk to you today just, uh, just for a little while 
Uh, I know there's been quite a bit of emphasis uh, even this morning in Teresa's Bible study on on the battle that we face. And, And let me just say this in kind of agreeing together with what she taught today and what she preached, if you would. Uh, we were designed to do spiritual battle. Amen. True. We weren't designed to just sit back spiritually and watch things happen. God meant for us to be warriors. Amen. And uh, the battle that we face and the time that we live in, uh, more than anything, we need, to be, we need to be warriors for Jesus Christ. We need to be battling and, and making sure that we're being spiritual in an age when it seems like most of our world is turning itself away from God. Uh, we see it in the schools. We see it in public places, the mention of Jesus, the reading of the Bible, prayer in school. All of those things used to be there when I went to school and uh, may still be in some states down in the southern states, but in most areas even of North America today, uh, you can't hardly do that anymore without being condemned for what you say and what you believe. So we are living in a time of spiritual battle. Uh, Along with that, we notice the deterioration in morals and ethics in our world today. And, uh, and that is going to be a regressive thing that's going to continue. Uh, society doesn't heal itself in of itself. It just doesn't happen. And, uh, but we need a God that can change us. And only God can change us. Only God can make that difference. And if you've heard me preach for any time at all, you'll know that I believe that it's only God that can, can take away some of the habits and different things in our lives and make us a whole new creation. Something totally different than what we were. I'm thankful he did that in my life. I was talking with my wife after she got back and and we were sitting there talking where we would be if it hadn't been for God in our lives. And she had said we probably wouldn't be together today. And uh, because there was just a lot of things going on in our lives. And so I'm thankful to God for what he's done. And I feel a sneeze coming on. And if I sneeze into this thing, it's going to be really loud. (laughs) I'm going to hold it back. Uh, first question is, the, is the prophet asked this woman in the, in the first passage that we read, um, asked her, what do you have? So I'm going to ask you the question today. What do you have? What talents, what abilities, what, what has God placed at your disposal today? Because you see, God didn't call you and God didn't make you and God didn't design your life with the intent that He would not be able to use the qualities and the gifts that He has placed in you. And uh, so when Elijah comes to this widow of Zarephath, uh, he asks her what she has and and, uh, he says, go bring me some water and along with the water, why don't you just bring me a small piece of bread or a cake is what the Scripture says. Her answer to him was, I don't have much. There is not much that I have at hand. I have a barrel at home. And and in that barrel I have a little bit of meal in the bottom of it. I have a small bit of oil in a cruise uh, beside it. And there's a famine in the land. And myself and my son, uh, we're going to go home. We're going to bake this last piece of bread. We're going to make the last bit of it. And uh, him and I will prepare ourselves to die. In the other passage of Scripture where it talks about Elisha, the widow's husband owed much. Her husband had passed away and, uh, and left a great debt for her to have to deal with. And uh, so when Elisha comes to her, she is also in the process of a great tragedy in her life. For in that time that she lived in, it was custom that, uh, that if you owed a great debt, that they could come and they could take your children or your husband and put them to work in the fields or whatever it was that they happened to do for a living. And you would be able to work off, or rather your children would be able to work off your debt for you by doing so. And so the woman is preparing for, for this occasion to happen because of the debt that she owed and the bondsmen were coming they were going to come and they were going to take away her sons and they were going to put them to work in order to pay the debt that she owed because of what her husband had borrowed not anything exhausted 
not anything that she had, and she had exhausted all she had to keep her and her sons alive. But at home, she did have one thing. She had one pot of oil left. That was all she had. Now, both of these prophets are asking something that is terribly hard. Have any of you ever been to the very limit of what you had financially or you're looking in your house and you're thinking, oh my goodness, this is the last package of craft dinner I've got here. And now I'm going to cook it up and I don't know where the rest of it's coming from. Listen, I, in North America, it's hard for us to conceive of that kind of hunger, of that kind of want where, where we're dependent upon somebody else to come and, and be a blessing to us in our lives. I remember when my wife and I first moved here to Port Alberni and, and initially for the first couple of years we were supported through our organization and, and then we had to try and make it on our own. And, and I've always been amazed. We were, we were um, there was two other couples my wife and I were dealing with when we first started the church and, and we were having services in our home and, and all three of us men were out of work. None of us had jobs, and, and so we had a midweek service Bible study, and, and rather than have the Bible study, we just we prayed, God, you've got a supply for us. We need you to provide the things that we need in order to, to be able to make it, and not only to take care of our families, but also to be a blessing to others as well. God, you need to supply. While we were in prayer, the phone rang. And uh, I don't know, some of you know Soupy Campbell around town. He's got those cranes parked on Rogers Street. There's four cranes out there. And I'd, I'd done some crane operating in my life and, and had, uh, didn't have my union card, but did have a ticket saying I'd taken some training. And, and it was him on the phone. And he said, I heard you were looking for work and, and uh, I, I want to you know, try you out and see if you can work and, and so forth. And I said, well, when do you want me to start? And he says, well, tomorrow morning would be great. And, uh, and like while we were praying on that, that midweek service night, I can't remember what night of the week it was, he called. And I've always been amazed at the way, you know, there's been times where I've been out of work, but then just at the right time, God would have something there and God would provide. These two ladies are at the very extremity of what they have and uh, don't know where they're going to be able to turn to to get, to get what they need next. And in one case, the lady is prepared to make her last cake or bread, drink the last bit of water, and her and her son were preparing themselves to die. Now the guy comes. The prophet of God comes. And he said, make me the cake. Bring me the water. Now, initially, you know, my first thought, I've got a family, I've got, you know, one of my boys is here, and, and I've got three other boys and a girl, and, and if they were all just growing up and somebody come and ask me if, if I would just give the last of what I had in my house for them to eat, I, I would, I don't know about you, but I would automatically be thinking, you know, maybe not. Now, I'm probably not as spiritual as this lady happened to be, but I'm thinking, you know, John's a hungry guy, you know? And when he was younger, he was a lot hungrier all the time. My boys. Let me tell you about my boys. I've, all four boys. We, we'd get invited to go out to eat somewhere. You know, we knew a few people around town. My wife would make a meal ahead of time to feed those boys so that they wouldn't consume everything when we went out to eat. And they would still do it. And uh, my oldest boy, we went down to Disneyland one time and, and we were right next to a spaghetti house there and it was all you can eat spaghetti and, and my oldest boy had five plates of spaghetti in one sitting. That, I mean, that's the way they were. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, if this guy comes and says, now I want you to feed me with that last bit of craft dinner that you've got in your cupboard and, and make it for me. I'm thinking, nope, not going to happen. But this lady didn't feel it that way, and, and so she went and she did just exactly what the prophet had told her to do, and she went home and she baked up this last bit of meal, and she made the cake, and, and she came and gave it to the prophet. And something miraculous happened, because every time she'd pour out that little bit of oil and she'd use that last bit of meal, the next time she'd go back to that pot and back to that cruise, There'd be meal in the, in the barrel and there'd be oil in the cruise. 
The other lady was, was of course, uh, uh, she was at the very extremity and the bondsman is going to come and take her two sons away to work and, and she doesn't know how to pay off the debt. And, and again, the question, what have you got? What have you got that, that you can, well, I have one pail of oil. That's all I've got is just one barrel of oil and that's all that's left. And uh, he said, well, just go and gather all the vessels that you can possibly find. And so she sent out her two boys and, and they went and borrowed vessels from Kathy and they borrowed vessels from John and from Leroy and, and everybody else that they could find and they brought all these pails into the house and she began to pour out the oil. And she'd pour it out. She'd go to the next one. And she'd pour it out. And she'd go to the next one. And she'd pour it out. And and it just kept multiplying. Every time she poured it out, there was more in the vessel, more in the cruise that she could pour into the next one. And the oil only stopped. She, She had enough to pay off her debt, but the only stopped when she ran out of vessels to pour it into Most of us here have known the goodness of God. We've known what it's like to have been in sin and know what it's like to have felt God touch us and change our lives. We felt convicted of our lives and we've come to a place of repentance and, and God has forgiven us our sins and, and uh, we've been baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost and God has done so many great and wonderful things in our lives. We have known and experienced the love of God in our lives. We have known and experienced the mercy of God in our lives and the kindness and the long-suffering that God has placed into our lives. We have known grace like probably no other dispensation in time. We have known the grace of God. God has given us within the church things that He has promised. He has given us healing. He has given us a testimony. He has given us the Holy Ghost. And He's given us all of these things not so that we could hold them in a cruise or a pail in our homes. Because if we do, it will fail. You've got a testimony of what God has done for you. Sometimes when, we, uh, when God touches us and God does something great for us, we may feel like, well, I've got just enough energy. I've got just enough Holy Ghost just to make it through this week. And maybe, maybe I can give a little bit to my family and help them make it through this week. And maybe that's all that I, you feel like you've got. But can I tell you something today? That if you will pour out everything that God has given you, that God's not in the business of leaving you without that. He will pour out more grace. He's going to pour out more mercy. You can never, ever make it so that God is down to the very last bit He's going to do for you because the more you give, the more He's going to give to you. The more you pour out into somebody's life, the more He's going to pour out into your life. And I want to talk about that for just a little bit today. Don't hoard it. Don't hold it to yourself. You say, well, I've only got so much energy and I'm getting so tired and I get weary and and I work hard all week. And and let me tell you something. If you'll just take that little bit of energy you have and pour it out into somebody's life, God's going to energize you. God's going to strengthen you. If you think that you've only got a certain amount of wisdom and you don't have understanding. I've heard people talk and, and say that, well, I don't necessarily feel like I can be a witness and a testimony. But if you'll just witness witness and testify of what God has done. Watch Him give you wisdom and a greater testimony in your life. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I, uh, I have in, in the past and in living for God have often felt like, God, I'm just running on the very edge and, and it's all I can do right now is just to make it through myself and God will put somebody in my path. Just at that moment in that time. And I can do one of two things. I can, I can either say, I really don't have it to give to you today. And make my way back home and hold on to it. Or I can... Can I tell you about what Jesus has done in my life? I don't know where you are with God right now. 
But let me tell you, if you've got an issue, if you've got a problem right now, I know a God that can solve that problem. If you've got something you're addicted to, I know a God that can deliver you. If you've got health problems in your life, I know a God that can heal you. I know a God that can change you, turn you around, make you whole. God wants to make us whole today. Amen. Hallelujah. Whole means that everything about your life, not just your body, not just your finances, but your emotions, your spiritual welfare, all of it. God wants to make it the way He designed us to be, to make us whole. Amen. So both of these ladies, one with Elisha and one with Elijah, both of these ladies were able to continue um, because they poured it out. They gave it away. So much around us in spiritual famine. So many people around us that are in need. If we can show kindness to them, if we can show mercy to them, if we can show love to them, I believe that God's going to pour the greater amount into us. Just pour it out. Just pour it out. Just give them whatever you've got. And watch what God does in your life. The meal didn't waste. It didn't end. The oil did not lessen or abate. And in Elisha's case, the oil continued to multiply until she ran out of empty vessels to pour into it and then stayed. It stopped. We only run out when we stop pouring ourselves into those that are empty. We live in a world of people that are empty of God. And they're waiting for us to pour it into them. In John chapter 6, Jesus was up on the mountainside and He was teaching the multitudes and they had followed Him out into the wilderness. And there were thousands, the Bible says, out there just to hear Him speak. This was during his time of popularity and, and, uh, and he, Jesus began to have compassion on them because they'd been sitting there listening to him all day. And now it was time, it was evening, he was going to, uh, and, but they were, they were hungry. They hadn't eaten all day. Right. Now, I'm not sure what they were thinking. You know, whether they thought this would be a quick sermon and head home for lunch or, or what it was, or there was just so much need in their lives, all they could think about was just, I've got to hear this man speak. Right. But here they are, thousands of people, followed him out in the wilderness. Jesus spoke to them for a time, I guess quite a while, because they ended up being very hungry and not prepared. But one boy, I don't know if his, it was a different time back then, I guess, uh, his mom packed him a lunch. Five fishes, two loaves. That was what he had. And uh, so they, Jesus told his disciples, go and feed the multitude. So what, we don't have anything? He says, well, go find out. Go figure out. What do we have here? What have we got? And so they found this boy with five fishes and two loaves. Now I'm thinking a boy's lunch. They're not big fish. I mean, he's not carrying around a salmon. You know, not five of them, definitely. Not what we find out here in the inlet. These are probably just, you know, small little fish, and he's got enough for a meal. And, uh, and two loaves, probably small little loaves of bread, that, that's going to carry him through. And he's packed this lunch all the way up into the wilderness yeah. with him. So it wasn't terribly heavy. And so the disciples come and, and to this boy, now... Give me your lunch. Now, I have to tell you something. You know, in, in my family's case, I know that my older boys, they went to somebody's house, good friends of theirs for dinner, and they had pizza. That was Adam and, and Tim. And, uh, and then they, you know, all closed their eyes, and my boys did too, and, and let's say grace. And by the time they opened their eyes, the pizza was gone because all the boys in the household had already grabbed their portion, you know. And... <laughs> And uh, they tell this story, and, and I just, what? <laughs> you know, I guess if I was the mom or the dad at that point, come on, give that up. It just, you're not getting anything now. <laughs> give it to the nickel boys. But anyway, they, so I'm thinking this boy has got these, but this is my lunch. Uh, but the master has need of it. Right. Jesus has need of what you have in your life. He has need of your testimony. 
He has need of the mercy that He's given you to give to somebody else. He has need of the grace that He's shown to you and the love that He's shown to you that you would show it to somebody else. The Master has need of it. Okay. Gave up His basket of food. Jesus got this little basket with five, five fish and two loaves and prayed over it. Divided. I mean, how do you divide that amongst the 12 disciples? You know, like, I'm going to cut this one in three. Yeah. And they're little fish to start with. Yeah. Put it in the basket for them. And the disciples are going around and, and uh, they fed all of the thousands of people that were gathered there. And you know what they did? They gathered up 12 baskets full of fish and bread. I think maybe they might have given it to the boy. Because he was the one that gave it up. And I think the Lord just blessed him for his willingness to give it up. Let's stand, shall we? Musicians can come. God's design for each one of our lives is that we would pour out what He's given to us so that others might be able to live. Jesus has need of you and what you have in your life. If God's done a miracle in your life, Share that with somebody else. If He's healed you, share that with somebody else. If He's provided miraculously in your life, share that with somebody else. If He's delivered you, share that with somebody else. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just close our eyes for a moment, shall we? What a miracle it is to know You, Lord. You know me. You know each one that is here in this sanctuary today. Lord, You know the things that we have held so dear in our lives and sometimes hoarded and protected, held on to. Lord, help us just to give of ourselves. We are your arms, your feet, your voice in this world that you have placed us in. And Jesus, help us just to give everything that you've placed at our disposal and give it so that somebody else might be able to have life. I'm still amazed, Lord, when I think back to when you spoke into my life and changed it. And Lord, I know there's so many more in this world today. God, there's an emptiness in every one of them if they don't know You. And so, Lord, let's, let's give them the opportunity to know You through our lives. Hallelujah. Thank You, Jesus. Thank You, Jesus. Speak to our hearts right now. As we're in this sanctuary and I feel your presence here, just speak to each one of us deep inside of our hearts. Let us know again that we are yours. And let us know again, Jesus, that we can give of the things that you have blessed us with and we will never, ever run out. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Cut a chorus of music.